All right, I'm super excited. I got the, uh, the Bushnell, at least part of the Bushnell family here. Um, welcome, Nolan. Welcome, Brent. Good to have you join us. Thanks, Mark. It's nice to be here. Uh, you know, getting the whole Bushnell family on a single Zoom, that would be a real, that would be a real challenge. <laughs> I'm up for challenges. That would be kind of interesting. <laughs> um, we'll start with this crew and then we'll, then we'll, uh, we'll move on. But, um, but I really appreciate this is a, a newly initiated um, Leaders Who Care video series we're doing as part of our whole fifth element platform. And, um, and so it should be, it should be fun. And I think uh, the usual, a good place to start would be just briefly introduce yourself a little bit about who you are and then we'll, we'll hit it. So um, you want to play, do rock, paper, scissors, shoot us to see who goes first. Yeah, you go first. Okay. Um, I'm Nolan Bushnell. I'm uh, an electrical engineer by training, but uh, sort of a multi faceted entrepreneur. Uh, I, founded Atari, and then Chuck E. Cheese, and then ETAC, and about 20 other companies had uh, good exits in, uh, in about two-thirds of them, three-quarters, and a couple of them I did a major face plant. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so you have to uh, take the slings and arrows, and it's a great game. And baseball, that'd be a pretty amazing batting average. Exactly. And so I, um, I'm, I'm apologetic, but not too much. <laughs> and you have a few, you know, children. One of them standing right over there, Brent. Yeah, my, yeah, my name is Brent Bushnell. I'm you know, one, of, one of eight kids, uh, you know, Nolan's oldest boy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm an engineer and an entrepreneur. Um, been been building companies, you know, most of my adult life and, and currently running a company called Two Bit Circus. Uh, we've been around, uh, you know, almost a decade building big attractions for brands, uh, you know, ultimately did our own traveling carnival uh, before opening what we call a micro amusement park, uh, which is a term we just made up, but it's a, you know, 40,000 square foot entertainment complex in the middle of downtown LA with a hundred seat interactive theater, a virtual reality arena, you know, a carnival midway and a whole arcade and, you know, a, a restaurant and bar. It's a ton of fun. Uh, we've been open there two years. It's basically a turnkey replacement for mall anchor tenants. You know, as Macy's and Sears and JCPenney and all that stuff goes away, real estate's really looking for a new way to, to, to uh, you know, drive traffic. And, and we've got a solution that people are loving, especially when it's not in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> uh, and then uh, and I'm also the chairman of our, of our nonprofit foundation, which um, uh, uses games and play to get kids excited about uh, science and engineering and hands-on activities. Yeah, I remember getting uh, being fortunate to come in just before it opened, and it was uh, really exciting. And I'm excited about talking about it more again for sure. And uh, and you know, with eight eight kids, Nolan, um, that you know, remember the, it's the joke when you have two, you can play man-to-man -man coverage, but then after that, it's zone coverage, like in football. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> Well, I actually think it's more that, um, you know, insanity is hereditary. You get it from your children. <laughs> now I know what I can blame my kids on. Nice. Um, so listen, you start with, you know, you, as a teenager, you, you what I understand, remember, you, you tinkered, you invented, then you had to run the family cement company. Because unfortunately, I believe your father passed away. Um, so I want to know, was your mom one of those hidden figures and that's where it kind of came from? Or did it all start with you just looking to be entertained or what? I think I've been blessed, cursed with curiosity. And uh, I think my mom was actually long suffering as my wife is. <laughs> and, and I think that um, fundamentally, I was very interested in the way the world works. And it went from electronics and ham radio to cars. I learned how to re, you know, overhaul cars and I fixed TVs and washing machines. And, and then uh, it kind of flowered full, full bore as uh, the video game industry. And then uh, 
I kind of thought that uh, games and food went together like peanut butter and chocolate and did Chuck E. Cheese. And, and um, you know, it's, I really think that the, the prime motivator is curiosity. So then Brent, your dad worked in an amusement park. He founded Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> and you have seven other siblings. So somewhere along the way there, did the word circus come into your mind? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a fun, it's a fun evolution because, you know, dad always, uh, you know, had a, a, a you know, a, a, his workshop that looks a lot like the one you see there. You know, there were tools and all sorts of stuff, you know, sort of, we had a really rich environment. And so we were, you know, tinkering at a young age. Uh, you know, he was always, you know, encouraging us to, to, you know, go out on our own, be entrepreneurs. You know, he was like, you can do whatever you want, but you know, you're going to be the happiest if you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, you know, it, he was so effective in, in, you know, kind of really seeding independence in all of us that, you know, all my siblings, we left the nest and didn't even go into games and entertainment. You know, we went into other things. You know, I, I was, you know, fascinated with biotech and worked in DNA synthesis for a while and started a company with my brother doing outsourced IT. And we were building SaaS applications for, you know, auto salvage and aftermarket insurance and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, we were really, you know, kind of going in the other direction of, of games and entertainment. We're like, we can do this on our own. We don't need, you know, what dad was into. Uh, and, and, but then at a certain point had this moment that, that, uh, you know, met my co-founder, started collaborating, making, you know, games and, and interactive art, and then was like, oh my God, what have I been doing? This is amazing. This is what I love and know so much about. And, but it sort of took, uh, you know, a, about a 10 year, you know, cycle to kind of really come back to where we'd started. Um, and, uh, but, but I have always been obsessed with circus. Um, and, you know, actually, dad took me to an amusement park when I was little. And, and I remember getting to walk around for a while by myself and just see, seeing this, this, this sort of magic and mystery everywhere that really, you know, lodged itself deep. Of course, that, you know, Hugh Jackman, is it the show, showman? Um, it's, a, it's a great, 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 great movie about, you know, about uh, Barnum and everything. Um, yeah. Nolan, were you going to say something there? I was just going to say that the amusement park he was wandering around at a relatively young age. And, you know, it's, it's always this thing where my wife is you know, long suffering. And so me letting Brent do that was, was a thing, but, but it was Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And that's a magical place all by itself. Beautiful, yeah. super old, right in the middle of the city, you know, really, really special place. So yeah. That's not all he did. I hope he didn't, partake in all the other stuff in Amsterdam when he was a kid there too, did he? Yeah, no, Copenhagen, Copenhagen. Oh, Copenhagen, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, it was close. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to know, um, it's taken decades for brands, leaders of companies to, to realize finally that um, aligning the brand, aligning themselves with social impact is actually good for business. Not to mention it helps you like you were attracting IT talent um, brand, it helps you attract the very best talent right now because people want to go where leaders do care about that. So with all the things you've been involved with from entrepreneurship to gaming to IT and biotech, when did it ever cross your mind that what you were doing did have social impact and actually even impacted community? Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. When we first started 2Bit, I uh, did a lot of research on what, what should the corporate form be, right? Should we be a... Uh, a, an LLC, a corporation, a nonprofit. At the time, the Benefit Corporation was just starting, and and you know, I wanted something that was, you know, multi bottom line, right? You know, good for obviously for the shareholders and the employees and the community and the environment. You know, sort of all the pieces. But none of them. I didn't really like any of the forms, right? The Benefit Corporation was early. You know, you 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 could only raise grant money for nonprofits, but you but you know equity was tough you know you know if you were for profit you couldn't get access to the grant money but then you you were only going you know for 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 equity and so um we ended up going you know with a, with with the for profit out of the gates but that you know that sort of ethos was was you know super um deep seated and and the evolution was really organic we were first an agency doing a lot of of branded work 
Uh, but a lot of that stuff was big spectacle. You know, we built a huge Rube Goldberg machine for, for with, with OK Go as a, as a music video. We bungee jumped a car. You know, uh, we ended up as the on-camera inventors for Extreme Makeover Home Edition. My, my co-founder and I and one of our lead engineers, Dan Busby, you know, we were all you know, getting to do these huge spectacles, a bunch of nerds, you know, doing this kind of special, you know, kind of really high profile engineering stunts. And, and we started getting these calls from parents and teachers being like, that was awesome. Like you guys did that for, you know, for, for the general public, but we've been using that as an educational tool. Uh, and so when we finally decided to do our own thing and, 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 you know, rather than supporting other people's events, do our own event, we called it the STEAM Carnival for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And the idea was, here's all this high-tech entertainment we've been building. That'll be one half. And then the other half is going to be a bunch of hands-on projects to inspire kids about science and engineering. And, and, and the message being, we built all this stuff over here. It's not that hard. If you want to, you can too. And here's how, over here. And, and, you know, the, we launched that on Kickstarter and the result was really magical and people really got excited. And so it, what the, 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 the evolution of, of, you know, our nonprofit really happened organically. And, um, and it's been, it's been great because we now, you know, are, are able to play in a, in a, in a couple of different locations and, and the, the, the staff from the corporate team volunteer with the nonprofit team and the nonprofit team gets to spend time with the, the corporate team and learn and be around it. And our HR helps support them and our, you know, resources are theirs. And so it's a really uh, uh, neat ecosystem. No, it's, it's super cool. I know Nolan, you, I don't know, were you thinking about the educational value when you started with Atari and Chuck E. Cheese and, but then you got even bigger into education after that. Can you, what were yeah. you what, what, what I discovered is that video games are a very, very powerful communication tool, which is sort of the, the bedrock of, of education. And I was sure that the video game technology was going to revolutionize education, and it didn't happen. And so I said, well, you know, if you want something to happen, you got to do it yourself. And so I started a uh, an education company that used this concept that called um, adaptive practice and it's literally 10 times more efficient than a, a movie or a lecture or what have you I mean kids that uh, do one of our lesson literally retain it 10 to 20 times better I've often felt that if everybody used the adaptive practice methodology you could put you could cram four years of high school into about six months. Mm -hmm. um, right now I'm doing work with the Nevada prison system through a, a friend of mine who, uh, you know, I just, I write stuff and send him videos and do things kind of like this. Um, and it's a uh, eight week program, four weeks before the prisoner is released on, on parole and four weeks in a halfway house. And we've been able to get uh, an 87% uh, uh, job placement. And, and they still have the job six months later, which is, you know, and without our program, it's 7%. <laughs> so the effectiveness is massive. And, uh, and so I'm very proud of that. Which shows you, you, can, you can make money and do good at the same time. It's not rocket science per se, but it took us, it seemed a long time, a long time to get there. And, um, you know, um, my grandparents used to say, and I, and, and probably everybody's grandparents used to say, um, with a Kiev Russian accent, you know, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing. You know, that was, and they were being sincere, worked super hard, super kind, but they were being totally sincere that that's the most important thing. And if you look now, technology is still zooming. COVID is hitting everything and impacting everything. Um, and people are thinking a little bit, I have more time to think a little bit more as to what's going on. I'd love to get your both, both your views on how that's going to change even more dramatically faster. The future is here faster with, with education, with work, and even just doing business. Love your thoughts on that. Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in there and say that one of the things that, that, COVID has done is really accelerate 
you know, the uptake of, of a lot of these programs, right? Just out of necessity. And, and tell, I think medicine is actually a really good example. Telehealth and the tools for telehealth have been around for, you know, a long time. And they were sitting there collecting dust over in the corner. And all of a sudden there was a real reason for it. And people realized, oh my gosh, this is super effective. And the doctors are sitting there with tons of time on their hands because they can, you know, do the, do the, you know, the meeting super fast and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're off and running. Uh, and so I, you know, we're seeing that now. Obviously, there's tons of challenges in education because you know it's a, 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 an extra burden on the parents, right? They're trying to now do their job as well as be a full-time parent, uh, you know, a full-time educator. Um, but I think that it is forcing the tools, you know, to be utilized and to get better and and you know to be incorporated, which which you know is is stuff that's going to last after the pandemic is over, you know, even, you know, the fact that we're doing this over a video call, it used to be you're on the phone or you were in person, but the video call wasn't really, a, you know, a, a, a normal, a normal option. You could Skype and a few people did that, but most of the time it was phone and, and video, or phone and, and, and live. Video is now a first class solution um, that, that yeah. people expect. Well, I told you, I'm waiting for Scotty beam me up next. That's what I'm waiting for. Um. <laughs> well, you know, I think that, um, the computer is probably going to double or triple effectiveness in education. And, and I actually think that if I were taking a blank sheet of paper and designing the school system for the future, I would have a hen and chicks model. And that means that there is kind of a bigger facility that has labs and and uh, sports equipment and what have you and then a bunch of satellites which are essentially uh, within walking distance of a neighborhood that can handle that maybe has you know 20 kids maybe 30 uh, primarily working on computers but you get the the babysitting effect by being able to go somewhere and have some adult supervision. And then uh, once or twice a week, they go to the master place and, uh, and share resources of things that uh, are better for, you know, having assemblies where you're with a bunch of kids rather than just a small set plays, you know, additions. Um, I, I think you can also, add curriculum where I think so many skills today which are more important than a strict academic course. Like I really think that, first of all, everybody needs to be able to type at 50 to 100 words a minute. Second, they need to be able to make a YouTube video. Third, they need to be able to write a script and act it. They, they need to do a, bo a, a podcast. They need to write a, a story and publish it on Amazon. You know, these are all things that start to integrate a child into the adult's world, maybe eight years faster than before. And I think the whole world will be better and particularly the kids. Anyway, yes, that, that's brilliant. Um, you know what I've noticed a lot of, um, well, we, before we got on, Brent, you and I talked a little bit about real estate and a lot of people are going to be staying home. So it's going to be a lot of commercial real estate open. Um, who knows, maybe both of your ideas you just talked about would be put into those, into those spots of real estate. And what I have noticed finally is that business leaders who care have realized that they have to take care of the, the triple well-being, I find, their financial well-being, the physical well-being, and the mental well-being of their people to be able to keep them and attract more people. Um, and I remember when Owen, you were telling me about the hand-eye coordination once of the, the video games and how that's going to make an impact on, on um, future work that they do and so on and so forth. And, and, uh, and also, their, basically, their, their well-being is, is one of, and it goes back to my grandparents, about the most important thing is your health. Yeah. I'd, love your, I'd love your thoughts on, on that whole aspect of financial, physical, and mental well-being that um, has to be insured right now. Well, first of all, exercise is really and should be 
massively integrated into schools. A PE class at three in the afternoon is wrong. What you need to do is every child needs to exercise for 20 minutes and get their heart rate up to 80% of maximum for 20 minutes at the beginning of the school. If that happens, all of a sudden ADHD goes away um, and you know depression goes away and obesity goes away. <laughs> and uh, you know, your, your brain is basically primed for learning after that exercise. And so they've taken equivalent schools and just moved, you know, the PE to the, to the beginning of the day and, and you get staggering results. Yeah. There's an interesting book called Spark written, written by a guy named John Raddy, who's a, a, a doctor and a, and a PhD in, uh, from Harvard that uh, has done massive studies on that. And, and uh, you know, anyway, that's, we could riff on that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, you know, Mark, I, I think that your, your question, you know, extends, you know, not just to school, you know, to work. The, right. the, the, the fact that, you know, these three domains as, as the nine to five, 40 hour a week dissolves and you could be working from home, you know, and at this point, if you're at Twitter, you know, you can work at home the rest of your career. Uh, you know, the, all of a sudden, the, the, the boundaries between work and play and life start to really go away. It takes some active management. And, you know, I think that wellness has, has, has really rocketed to the, you know, the top of a, of a lot of, uh, of considerations lately, because people are realizing mental fitness is, is something that, that takes real attention and, and you know, has, uh, you know, needs, needs to be managed. So, you know, I, I think that it's, it's more important than ever. And even in a post COVID world where, you know, the structure that comes from having a commute and, and, and certain patterns that, that, it, you know, emerged from us going out for work and coming back for home and family it is, is going to really need, you know, some review in order to keep people happy and sane. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. And um, I'm having a lot of conversations with it. I, I actually started seeing it way back when, when a one of my clients, my clients would always say, well, what do we have to do to get the best people? And the word care kept coming up just for decades in my mind. That's what we got to leaders who care finally. And, but just a quick example, Ryder had a lot of young people and um, they had kids and they were stressed out and whatnot. So they ended up after talking, how do we keep them? They built a daycare center. It wasn't rocket science. They built the daycare center right there. Yeah. So all of a sudden we're saying Ryder cares about their people because they built the daycare center and stuff like that. And, uh, I personally think one of the top positions in a company now should be the chief well-being officer who's totally. making well, it all and, and really great HR people, you know, their, their role is not just hiring and firing, but the happiness in the middle, you know, the time and, and, uh, you know, two bits been really fortunate. I love our HR lead, you know, she came out of Cirque du Soleil and has been so incredible at, at making it a fun place that, you know, people are hyper, you know, connected and there's fun rituals and, you know, culture and, you know, that's, that stuff's, that stuff's important. No, I think it's awesome, especially being from Cirque du Soleil and I'm from Montreal. So I like her even more. <laughs> <laughs> So one, one last question on this thing, and I'm going to grab it for a quick short video, but um, graduating class, there's no graduation. They're feeling like left out and everything. So I'm a graduate and I come to you guys and say like, with everything going on, what, what now, what next? Well, you mean next for us? No, for I'm the graduate. From the graduate, oh. you're telling me, yeah. Oh, it's too late for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I don't believe kids should go to college until they know what to, they want to do. Um, I think it's a ginormous waste of time and uh, they're floundering around. Become, if, if you're just walking out the door of high school, I would spend three months and go a walkabout in Las Vegas and attend every trade show that comes to Las Vegas and walk the floor. They don't need to necessarily go into the breakout sessions because, and, you know, they have to learn how to, how to do a, a Photoshop of a, uh, of a New York times reporter so they can get in free. <laughs> 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 and uh, if they, 
are diligent about walking the floor of 20 to 50 trade shows, I think they'll come out with an idea of what they might want to do in life. Hmm. And uh, I mean, the idea that you go to four years of college to try to figure out what you're going to do, I think is just massively insane. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, it, it just, it just says that, it, you know, you're never going to reach your direction, you know, reach your destination if you don't know where you're going. And, and I, I just like our kids, um, half of them graduated from college and half of them didn't even go or went a little bit. And I see very little difference in the outcomes because the ones that didn't go had a pretty strong idea of what they wanted to do. And, uh, you know, Brent was one of the graduates and Tyler and Wyatt were. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, I didn't graduate. I, I went, you know, I actually ended up going for five years, but I'm still a few courses shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to make it public. <laughs> it's, hey, I, I make no, you know, uh, 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 yeah, I'm not embarrassed by it. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to have missed those classes, but, you know, I mean, I was running my first company from, you know, from the halls of UCLA. And, uh, you know, it was, but, but I, I do, you know, I left school for, for a number of years and, and the, the time period of starting that company and then going back to school. I mean, that's right. I, I, the, when I went back to school after having run my company for a little while, it was invaluable because all of a sudden all of the professors were teaching something that had connection to my real life. You know, these were ch database challenges that I'd run into. These were operating system challenges that I didn't understand, you know, but it, but it had real context with, and, and that was, it made it all real. And, and, you know, I do think that having, you know, and if you don't know what you want to do, go out and try a lot of different stuff. And I, you know, that's where dad's going with the, with the, the trade show is expose yourself to a lot of things. You don't, you're not expected to know. Well, you know what I, what I find too is um, it's, I love what you guys are saying. Two of my three kids didn't finish college. They, they went into acting and, 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 and another one is in music and they're doing great. And another one did and he's doing fine. The thing that bothers me a lot of times the most is how people look down at somebody who went to a trade school or became a plumber, became this, became that and did other stuff. And just because you didn't go to this college, you're not as good as this person, um, or even vice versa. It's great if you go to that college, but um, that to me is a community thing where that's almost the health of the community is how we treat each other. Well, Mark, one of my favorite quotes is, is Madeline Engel, and she says, inspiration comes during work, not before it. And so the idea is, awesome. is you are actively engaged in a pursuit, you know, and, and, and that's when you start to see the opportunities and, and whatnot, not, you know, but not, you know, you know studying first and, you know. Yeah, right. right now, you know, I, and as far as trace school goes, I mean, somebody goes to college, majors in mystical dance and comes out and comes out and, and drives uber whereas a trade school guy uh, or girl becomes a plumber and they can afford to buy a house because they don't have student loans and they, <laughs> they can yeah. actually get on with life and you know life is good and you know what's it's it's not a bad idea no not at all and uh it, and it doesn't mean everybody has to do that or this or whatever, but um, but I think yeah, I love that quote though too, Brent. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna steal that. Uh, you know, um, if I could say one one last thing, you know, to that graduating yeah. class, you know, there's this incredible concept uh, uh, from Japan called ikigai, and and it's about you know, it's basically a, an approach to to finding happiness. And you know, ikigai says that if you can get these these four circles to overlap, then you've really found true happiness. And, and that those four circles are do what you love, do what you can be paid for, do what you're good at, and what the world needs. And at the, at the intersection of those four things, you know, you, you have, you know, real, real, real purpose. And, you know, there is, you know, you, you might not know the answer to all those, but iterating and trying lots of stuff helps you figure out what it is that you like to do, what you love, what you're good at, you know, what people are willing to pay you for. Now, the, what the world needs, 
Now that one, there's, that's super clear, right? There are so many places that have documented the problems that the world is facing, you know? And so look at, you know, the National Academy of Engineers, look at the UN Sustainability Development Goals. There are so many smart people who've said, these are the things that are the most highly leveraged problems that the world needs help with. And, you know, and then you can start to really work down that line of, 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 of Ikigai, um, you know, to, to have a happy life. Wouldn't have a huge impact. inspired. Yeah. Well, you know, I think you can also just look at things that piss you off. <laughs> you know, like I would love to be able to drive from Santa Monica to downtown LA in nine minutes. And um, not being able to do that at various times of day or night really irritate me. So, you know, I'm on the, on the board of a uh, self-driving car company, and we're going to get there probably within five to seven years. Anyway, uh -huh. and so, you know, there, there are all kinds of things that, like I recommend reading science fiction, and not dystopian science fiction, but, but uh, optimistic science fiction of, of a world and and some of the interesting things, because a lot of the ideas, and you say, when you're reading a, a good sci-fi, you say, I want to live there. <laughs> a, la, a la Jetsons, if you will? Well, yeah, Jetsons, or, 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 or some of them, I mean, the, uh, the whole idea of a frictionless environment for what I call the, the everyday tumble and throw of, of, of life, when you can remove the friction and, and make things efficient, it's good. Yeah, all kinds of friction, even between people, right? Yep. Hey, love having you guys on. I really appreciate your time. And um, can't wait to get back in there and uh, enjoy circus and, um, and, uh, you know, have a coffee or dinner or something in person. That'd be great, Mark. Thanks.